In this activity, we're going to be taking photographs of the retina at the back of the eye using the Center View Digital Retinography System. Now this activity unfortunately also can't be done at home since you need a very specialized camera in order to take pictures of the retina. But just to show you, what we would ordinarily do in class is to have each student sit at this camera and then take a picture of their retina and then go through as a group what the structures are that we're seeing in those photographs. And so we can do that now. Let's have a look at this subject. And so we've got her seated at the camera. Now there's a chin rest that she'll place her chin on and that chin rest is also a button so the camera can't work unless you press down on that chin rest and so that's what you see her doing here. There's also a metal bar across your forehead and so you should press your forehead against the metal bar and that will orient your head in the right position. And you can see here that now you're in the correct position for the camera lens to find your eyes. Now you can see us placing a cover over the subject's head and that just cuts out extraneous light from the classroom and also allows the pupils to dilate, allowing for a better picture. The whole system is automated and so once you press start, the machine will automatically find each eye, focus correctly on the retina and then take a picture. Here you can see the system searching for the pupil and you can see the pupil diameter is measured as 4.4 millimeters here. And then once both photographs are taken, the images appear on the monitor and you can select the one that you want to have a look at and bring it up on the screen. And we would ordinarily then gather around and have a look at the pictures and talk through some of the structures. So let's do that now. So now if we open up one of the pictures, this is the right eye that we took just then. Uh, you'll see some structures. Now these structures are, are relatively common. If you look up uh, optic disc, fovea, fundus photography, then there's dozens of pictures like this, hundreds of pictures like this on the internet. So you can see the main structures labeled really easily. But I just wanted to go through, uh, through those structures and talk about a couple of things uh, as I usually do in the face-to-face -face class. So um, some structures are really easy to see uh, and some structures are a little bit more difficult. And so we just wanted to get you to have a bit of a think about these structures and how they affect vision and what part they play in vision. So first of all, let's just have a look at some of these basic structures. Now the parts that you'll be able to see most obviously is the macula, which you can see here, and uh, the optic disc, which you can see here. So the optic disc is of course the blind spot. So all those activities where we were looking at the blind spot and measuring the blind spot uh, and trying to get images to fall on the blind spot so that they disappear. Uh, this is the structure there. Now you also see all the blood vessels coming out, so they are also uh, very obvious. When you go to an ophthalmologist, uh, the first thing that they do is have a look at all those blood vessels and check that there's no bleeds, there's no uh, weaknesses, no swellings in the wall. So these are all very cylindrical uh, and even in diameter. Uh, and so, so these are all really good. Weaknesses often occur at junctions of blood vessels, and so you would have a look around sort of um, the, the various branch points of these blood vessels. Um, just out of interest, if we, oops, if we zoom in a little bit, you should be able to differentiate veins from arteries. So the central artery of the retina is usually nasal most. So this vessel here, which is closest to the nose, closest to the medial side of the retina, this is the central artery. And then this vessel here, which is entering, uh, and it's sort of branching here, so there's a lower branch here, an upper branch here. Uh, that's the, so that's the central vein of the retina. Now here they sort of look quite similar because they're backlit and so you can mainly see the red of the blood. If you look out a little bit further, you'll notice that blood in the veins is a little bit darker than blood in these arteries. So the oxygenated blood in the arteries is noticeably more red than the deoxygenated blood in the veins. So that's one thing to notice. You'll also notice that veins also tend to be a little bit wider. The walls of arteries or arterioles tend to be a little bit, um, a little bit more muscular and so they tend to hold their shape, their roundness a little bit better whereas veins tend to sort of, uh, they're not quite as structurally rigid and so they tend to sort of flop flat a little bit more. Um, so they tend to be a little bit wider. Uh, as such, you can usually see a, a brighter shininess to the top of the arteries, 
or arterioles. Um, so you can usually see this reflected light a little bit more than you can in these veins. Now just as a point of interest since we're here, uh, whenever you have um, blood vessels crossing, as they call it an arteriovenous crossing, you almost always have, so 70% of the time you'll have arteries crossing over the top of veins. Um, so there's a big one here, but occasionally, so about 30% of the time, you'll have a vein going over the top of the arteries. So you can usually see all that. Here's a, a uh, there's the arteries here. Here's a branch, and so this is going over the top of the vein. Now sometimes it's a little bit hard to tell. Here's the artery, and it's going over the top of the vein. Here's the artery, it's going over the top of the branches from this one, which was the vein and so on. So that's just something to keep an eye out for if ever you see it. Now if we have a look back at the optic disc, uh, there's a couple of structures that we can sort of differentiate in, inside here. So you can see the rim of the optic disc itself, and so that's where all the ganglion cells from, um, or the, all the axons from the ganglion cells collect together to form the optic nerve, which then runs back to the, to the various optical centers of the brain. Now in the center of this, there's a slight depression called the optic cup, and between the edge of the optic disc and the edge of the optic cup is called the neuroretinal rim. Now they're of interest because if you get high pressure in the eye, so during glaucoma for example, then that pressure will push down on that optic cup and make it larger and will change the shape of it. So you can usually diagnose increased ocular pressure in part by looking at uh, these structures here. Now when you go for an ophthalmologic exam, uh, you, uh, one of the things they're looking for is the distances between the edge of the, uh, the optic disc and the edge of the optic cup. And so what they're looking for is the ISNT rule, the ISNT rule, uh, which is looking for the distance between the optic disc and the optic cup is largest inferiorly. The next largest is superiorly, the next largest is nasally, and then the, the smallest distance uh, is usually temporally. And so that's the isn't rule. So I should be larger than S, which should be larger than N, which should be larger than T. Now one of the questions that we usually ask during this practical when, when the students are looking at these images is why is the optic disc such a bright color? Why is it so bright yellow? Uh, the reason it's bright is because it's reflecting light, so why is it so reflective? Now one of the things you should know to answer this question is what is the optic disc? What's occurring at the optic disc? Now you should know that the optic disc is where all of the axons from the ganglion cells across the entire retina are all coming together in order to exit through the back of the eye to form the optic nerve. Now the axons of ganglion cells are not myelinated as they travel across the retina. So all of the axons are actually traveling in front of the, uh, the photoreceptors. Now because of a quirk of design, all of the axons of ganglion cells are actually in front of the photoreceptors. So those axons are actually between the light coming in and the photoreceptors which you want, them, want that light to get to. If those axons were also myelinated, then they would completely block the light trying to get to the photoreceptors. So the axons from ganglion cells are unmyelinated as they're traveling across the retina. Now zoomed in like we are, we can actually see all the fibers from all the ganglion cells running across the retina. So you can see these stripes leading in towards this optic disc. So they're all the fibers. Now once all those axons reach the optic disc, they all then become myelinated. And so when the light from the fundoscope flashes, it then bounces off this bright white fatty substance, i.e. the myelin. And so you can see that is this big bright white or yellowish disc. So I hope that makes sense. Now if we come over here back to the, to the macula. So the macula was this larger central part of the eye. And so this is where vision is added to. 
So that structure there delineated by the blue circle is the macula. Now in humans, the macula is about 5.5 millimeters in diameter. And so it's actually quite a big structure. And so going back to our, our image. And so on our image, that's, that's that structure there. I think this one, uh, when I put this box around it, it's about 5.2 millimeters in diameter. Now inside the macula, um, you have the fovea itself. And so the fovea in humans is about 1.5 millimeters in diameter. So it's this sort of darker area in the center of the macula. Now the reason why it's darker is that all the overlying tissue gets pushed aside from the, uh, from the, from the fovea. If we have a look at another picture from the side, so this is the fovea from the side, and you can see the fovea, this is all part of the fovea, and you can see all this overlying tissue um, leading into this central pit has all been pushed to the side. And so the pigmented epithelium, which is behind the retina, um, becomes a little bit more visible. And so the tissue, rather than being sort of this uniform brownish pink across the whole area um, around the fovea, uh, is actually a little bit darker because you, you're not, you don't have that overlying tissue as much anymore. Now in the center of the fovea, there's this smaller structure shown here by the circle called the foveal avascular zone. Uh, now that's the point at which all the blood vessels stop traveling in. So you can see that there's these very faint blood vessels traveling across even this part of the retina. But from this point onwards, those blood vessels stop. And so that's the foveal avascular zone. And in humans, that's about 0.5 millimeters. Now in the center, right in the middle of it, you can see this pit. So that's that pit that we saw over here. And that's where virtually every bit of tissue has been pushed off from the top of the photoreceptor cells, leaving just this pit right down to the bottom. And in actual photos from the outside, you can see, um, you can actually see this bright rim of reflected light from the base of the pit uh, shown here. And so that foveal pit is 0 0.15 millimeters or 150 microns in diameter. So it's really, really small. All right, so that's all that we wanted you to see from these images. We'll post some more so that you can have a look at different uh, eyes, see how individual variation means that uh, the structures look slightly different in each person. Okay, now one of the tutorial items in your notes asks you to measure the diameter of the optic disc and the macula and the distance between these two regions using this uh, fundoscope in imagery. So we'll do that. And now I'm going to show you how to do that in image J, which is what I've got this open in. So let me just close this one down. So we're not going to save that. I'll get rid of that. Uh, now you can either go file and then open and then open up some, um, open up the images, or you can bring the images over here. Now this is the picture that we were looking at just then. Uh, so these are the two that we captured just then. Um, and so you can just drag one of those pictures. So this is the right eye again, over to image J and then bring it up. You can press the plus key to make it a little bit larger. And so that's what I had done before to bring it up here. Now, ImageJ is a really good image analysis software. Lots of people use it in research uh, because it's free uh, and it, or rather it's open source. And so the research community has progressively over time made it more and more uh, complex and uh, given it more and more features. Um, and because it remains completely free, uh, lots of people end up using ImageJ. So I'm going to show you how to do these measurements that you're asked for in your tutorial items in ImageJ. So we've just opened up this image and I've just blown it up. Now the first thing we want to do is to set the units in image J so that we're measuring in millimeters. Now to do that, we're going to need a known distance on that photo that we've taken. Fortunately for us, the good folks at the Karolinska Institute have described the distance between the center of the fovea and the center of the optic disc as being 4.6 millimeters. And so we can use that value to calibrate image J. So what we need to find is the center of the optic disc. Now the optic disc isn't quite circular, it's sort of more oval shape. So when you draw on your circular shape, what you would do is adjust this up to here. 
and so to me that looks like the edges of the optic disc so that's our structure there now if you go over to analyze and set measurements these are the things that you can measure on any given image um, so we're going to get center of mass and Faraday diameter now we don't need anything else so I'm just going to click OK so now what I'm going to do is come over here and I'm going to cl uh, click Control M and that brings up the measurement page so now this performs all those measurements that we've asked it to uh, but it's in pixels by default the parts that we're interested in are Faraday diameter so the, the, um, the, the thing that says Faraday is, um, is th uh, 300 pixels and so that's the longest diameter of this oval and then minimum Faraday is 260 pixels so that's the, the minimum the, the narrowest diameter of this oval and so we're interested in these two points now we want to know where the center of this oval is and so XM means the X coordinate of the middle of the circle and YM being the Y coordinate of the middle of the circle so we can see that the center of the circle is located at these coordinates which is 1743 uh, in the X axis and 944 pixels in the y-axis so if we go to grab our line tool now and click from the center of the fovea and then drag so I'm left clicking and dragging over to here now if you have a look down at the bottom of the screen you can see my x and my y coordinates so I'm after 1743 1743 43 in the x-axis and 944 on the y-axis now this is really fiddly 944 okay cool so now this line here going from the center of the fovea to exactly that those central coordinates of the optic disc should be 4.6 millimeters in length so we'll go up to analyze and set scale and so there's the length of our line in pixels we're going to tell it that that line is 4.6 millimeters so we'll click OK and so now that line is still active so if we click Control M we should see that that line is 4.6 millimeters of course because we've just defined it as being that and now we've got our units we can put our circle around here and so here we are with our optic disk and now if we click control M we've got our measurements that we need to take so we were interested in the um, in the diameter of this now you calculate the diameter of an oval or an irregularly shaped structure by using what's called Faraday's diameter or a Faraday diameter is one way of doing it now a Faraday diameter is the average diameter using the uh, average of the longest dimension and the shortest dimension now if you remember when we set our measurements we clicked on Faraday diameter so that's one of the things that we're measuring and so this value here 1.725 millimeters is the large diameter and minimum Faraday 1.569 millimeters is the is the smallest diameter and so if we do so if we do an average of those 1.725 plus 1.569 divided by 2 so our Faraday diameter of the optic disc is 1.647 millimeters so does that make sense now next the tutorial asked us to find the diameter of the macula now I find now there's two parts of the macula there's the anatomical macula which is basically just the center of the back of the eye and as we said before that's 5.5 millimeters roughly speaking uh, for, for a particular person or for humans now there's also the clinical macula and the clinical macula is the part that you can actually see uh, and interact with um, so 
we're going to measure this part, which is the part that we can actually see. So in other words, we're going to measure the clinical macula. And as you can see, this is sort of an oval shape as well. So once again, we'll use ferro diameter. So we've put our circle around the structure of interest. And I'm going to click Control M. And these are our new values, which have just appeared down here. And so you can see that our ferro diameter can be calculated from the maximum. So the maximum is 2.084 millimeters plus the minimum diameter, which is 1.713 divided by 2. So that's the average of them, which is the ferro diameter. And so that's uh, 1.899 millimeters is the ferro diameter of the clinical macula. And so now we've got each of those measurements. So we've got the diameter of the optic disc, the diameter of the macula, and the distance between the two regions using fundus photography.